This video will give you a quick walkthrough of two different methodologies to compute the ion balance for waters that have been analyzed for major cations and major anions in addition to the alkalinity. So I'll provide this spreadsheet. This is the first method just using a simple Excel spreadsheet. And the method is really quite simple. Uh, you tabulate all of the positive cations and uh, sum them to a total cation count and you do the same thing for the anions. There's a couple things to note about using this spreadsheet. One, it's just a template. So uh, I've provided mock data here with uh, mock ions. And so these are some of the most common ions, but they're not the only things that you might find in water that you analyze. And so uh, if you analyze other cations or anions and they're present, you will have to amend this sheet, uh, which means that you'll have to also add uh, any relevant constants that are employed in the computation of the sheet. So let me walk you through how this works. So I've got uh, cations highlighted in this sort of yellowish color, and I have the anions highlighted in blue, and then the alkalinity measured as uh, the equivalent in calcium carbonate uh, uncolored here. Second column is the formula weight, so that's just the, the molecular weight of any of these uh, formula units. And then uh, the measured concentration is in milligrams per liter or parts per million. So these are the values you would input from your analyses, either through ICP, alkalinity titrations, or often ion chromatography or any other uh, spectroscopic assay that you may get the anions from. And then the molarity in millimoles per liter, so this is actually the millimolarity, uh, this is computed, and that's computed just simply using the uh, formula weight here, directly with the milligram per liter concentration, so that gives us concentration in units moles. Uh, and then we have the charge of these respective ions. And then we have this final column, which is milliequivalents per liter. And I have a little note here, just in case you forget, I have the same thing over here uh, and also here. Uh, so milliequivalents per liter is really just useful, uh, especially useful when you're trying to do these charge balances, because it's the same as the molarity. You just multiply by whatever the charge is. So if you have an ion like calcium 2 plus at a concentration of 0.68, then the actual concentration of charge contributed to the water is going to be twice that of 0.68, which is 1.35. And so you're just simply multiplying the concentration by the charge per mole of that particular species. And then the rest is pretty simple. You have your summed cations and your summed anions down here. So you just highlight and uh, add all those together. Do the same for the total anions. And then the ion balance is a percentage. And I have the actual equation here. It's very simple. It's just the sum of cations in milliequivalents per liter minus the sum of the anions divided by the sum of the cations plus the sum of the anions uh, multiplied by 100%. And that's computed just like that. And so in rigorous water analysis, aquatic chemistry, you're shooting for an ion balance of ideally 0%, right? It, it, it has to be 0% because all natural water systems are electroneutral. There's the same amount of positive and negative charge. We know that about the charge balance of any system. But any deviation from zero, which is normal, uh, gives you insight into um, the system itself, but also into your analyses. And you're shooting for uh, five percent if you can do it. Ten is reasonable. Beyond ten, you have a pretty big uh, systematic error in one uh, or more of your analyses, and there's ways to sort of deconvolute that. So this is a really nice sort of total ion check in the system that you're you're computing. A couple other notes here. So uh, I have alkalinity not highlighted here, and I have that measured in uh, milligrams per liter calcium carbonate, uh, because that's normally how you are computing it for your titrations. But you're going to want to convert that into a, a respective ion, which is typically the bicarbonate ion uh, for natural water samples, especially in uh, systems that have pHs that are uh, circumneutral, so around 7 uh, or slightly alkaline. Then you're typically having most of your uh, species in uh, H2CO3 minus, uh, in which case you can put your measured concentration 
in milligrams calcium carbonate per liter uh, directly here. And then uh, that number will be used to con convert to uh, an equivalence of the uh, HCO3. Um, and so that then uh, gets converted into the milli equivalence per liter of that HCO3 ion. You may note that that's probably not the, the most accurate way to do this because uh, we know that even though most of the carbonate species may be in a bicarbonate form, uh, that doesn't mean the carbonate is non-zero, in which case uh, in the second version of the ion balance, I'll show you how we may think about speciating uh, these into their respective concentrations as long as we know the sample pH. Uh, similarly, the same could be said about any of these uh, polyprotic anions uh, or these bases like sulfate, which um, we could protonate and we'll have some distribution of, of various sulfate species. Uh, the same is true about phosphate, uh, borates, silicates, etc. And so this gives us a really nice uh, course evaluation, but it doesn't capture all of the nuance of the chemistry, in which case we'd need some speciation. So I'll show you that next. So you probably want to do this uh, just by uh, using the template down here. So these are just example data so you can see how it's computed. And then the template here, you can fill in your actual values. And then you can copy this uh, and paste this um, likely after you've amended it for any additional cations or, or anions based on uh, what you know about your water samples. And then do this for as many samples as you have and then probably summarize that data in a separate uh, table form. Okay, the second uh, method for determining ion balance from measured values of your water samples is using this software program, Visual Mintech. And this is actually a pretty similar program to the Hydromedusa program you might have used before, where it calls upon uh, database equilibrium values for uh, a variety of chemical equilibria. Uh, and so we can load in a bunch of fixed values, measured values, and then uh, if we set something like the pH, we can allow the software to iterate and uh, compute the specific speciated forms of all of, uh, of our bases, um, but also of, of our cations uh, in terms of solids that may precipitate, etc. And And that's where this program is, is really useful. There's a lot more utility than what I'm going to show you, but um, for natural water samples, uh, this is especially useful because we can take this, we can compute an ion balance from our measured values, but then we can also compute things like saturation indices, which can tell us uh, whether we're undersaturated or supersaturated with respect to specific mineral phases uh, that we may be able to, to observe in the field in or adjacent to those water sources. So let me walk you through how I'd set this up, uh, at least for uh, this type of class. So let's start by taking the pH, and you've got lots of options here, but um, because we know the pH, we can measure the pH, we don't want to compute that. You could compute that if you didn't know it and you had uh, other components defined in your system, but we know it. And so in this case, uh, we measured this at a pH of 8.11. Similarly with the ionic strength, because again, all of these are going to be computed as, as uh, in terms of activities. Uh, so we want the ionic strength to be operative. Just like when we measure pH in the lab, what we're really measuring is the activity of the hydrogen ion, not the concentration of that. So that's already accounted for here. The ionic strength, uh, we in, unless we measure it, which you can using conductivity probes, uh, or we can just assume that the major ions are contributing most of the ionic strength, which is typically a reasonable approximation. So we'll leave this as to be calculated here. Next, we need to add our components. And so components are similarly defined in Visual Mintech as they are in Hydra Medusa. Uh, a component, if you can see from the list, uh, this doesn't have the periodic table like Hydra Medusa does, but, but it has similar operation. So there's at least one component for every element on the periodic table. And for some, there are more, 
And if there are more than one, that indicates uh, an additional oxidation state of that particular component. And so when you're thinking about defining something like calcium, you can scroll down to calcium here. Um, let's see, there's calcium. And note that calcium 2 plus is the only component to choose from. And so that's super convenient, and we can, we can just choose that. But if we look at something like carbonate or bicarbonate, we can see... Um, or carbon in general, we have the carbonate CO3 2 minus option here, but then we also have various options like the uh, dissolved inorganic carbon, that's all the possible inorganic contributions to carbon, including carbonate and bicarbonate. <clears throat> we have dissolved organic carbon, uh, etc. And, and, and uh, similarly, we could look at things like nitrogen, right? Uh, we have nitrogen as nitrate and nitrogen as nitrite, uh, two different redox states of the nitrogen atom. Uh, same with sulfur. So we've got several versions of sulfur. Um, we have uh, sulfur. We have other uh, form of sulfur here. We have the peroxisulfate. Um, we have S parentheses sulfate. That's the total sulfur content as, uh, as sulfate. Um, and then there's uh, of other varieties here as well. And so you'll want to choose the thing that represents the redox state of the thing that you're measuring. And what we're going to do is just go through these components, uh, pick the things that represent what we want on our measured values, and then we want to choose over here the concentration unit we want to represent them in. And so since we measured everything, in milligrams per liter here. I'm going to set that as milligrams per liter. We can also change the temperature of the system if, if we'd like, especially if we're model, modeling um, active waters that are below room temperature, not lab temperature. So you go through here, and if we look at calcium to start with, we'll take and select calcium. You can see the units change now to milligrams per liter here. I'll input 27.05 here. And then I'm going to click this button, Add to List. And nothing happens. And that's because what we've done here is created uh, essentially a spreadsheet list here. Hydrogen ion is always going to be defined. Never delete that. That's present. Even though it says zero, that's fine because it's actually uh, going to show up in this list of fixed species uh, because we fixed the pH there. So um, just leave that as zero in the model and then we can go through and keep adding everything. Okay so after I've added all of the species or the components that I've measured I can take a look at my list and just confirm against all my measured values that everything is being represented uh, and you can see that it didn't include nitrate because it was a measured value of zero or non-detect. Uh, I didn't include iron 2 plus for si similar reasons and so we end up having um, a list of components in this problem as it's defined that we can then run our model. So from here you can just click back to main menu and then uh, that list is stored and we can just click the run mintech. So that takes a few seconds depending on how many components you have added to your list uh, and then we get an output that looks like this. And so there's lots of info here, some of it relevant to this class, some of it beyond the scope of this class, but one of the things that's really great is that it lists out, based on all of the equilibria available in the database that it's calling upon, it looks at all the possible different species, um, soluble species, that could have speciated under the given constraints. So the measured values and the fixed pH value. And it gives you the concentration and the activity of those values and then the log version of that activity. And so you can see for, say, the calcium 2 plus ion, we have the calcium chloride, the single chloride plus ion, that ion pair. We have some soluble calcium carbonate. We have some soluble calcium bicarbonate, etc. And so these are all of the different uh, values and different components that are potentially available in our solution given the uh, pre-generic input. And this is the, the level of nuance provided by the speciation software that doing a simple ion balance doesn't provide in Excel.
So a couple other things. So uh, you can see it computed our, our total ionic strength here. Um, it ran this for a series of three iterations. It has the sum of cations. This is in units equivalence per kilogram, which is a little weird, but you can convert out of that. Um, and the same for the anions. And then it c computes its own charge difference here in percentage, which is a the equivalent to our ion balance. And so it's saying that we're, we're about 1.9% out considering uh, all the speciation compared to what we saw of 2.48 for the same inputs using our more simplified uh, Excel spreadsheet model. Okay, a couple other things that are cool about this that would be relevant are to these two buttons down here. So view species distribution shows all of these various species, but then it ranks them by percentage presence uh, in that solution. So if we look at this species distribution, what we see is uh, for the component, for each component we define, let's say we're looking at the calcium component, about 94% of that calcium is just in the aqua ion, the calcium 2 plus ion, and then small percentages are distributed out as uh, these other ion pairs. And uh, similarly for carbonate, you can see that um, actually, uh, a pretty small amount of this solution is in the carbonate CO32 minus form, whereas about 96% is in that bicarbonate form. Uh, and so our estimate in our uh, earlier spreadsheet, where we were looking at just the carbon or bicarbonate here as the primary form of carbonate, as estimated from the alkalinity. Uh, we said that that was the only species present, and in this case at this pH, then uh, that was pretty reasonable um, because 96% uh, uh, is actually in that form. So this is really great. You can take these data and you can uh, put them into Excel, print to Excel. You can plot them and sort of get your speciation uh, diagrams or log species diagrams depending on what you want. Uh, this other button, Display Saturation Indices, is really great for looking at natural waters, especially from a geochemical lens or an environmental chemistry lens. So what this tells us is all of the possible minerals that may be formed with the combination of components or elements that were provided in that original data. And up here we have the log IAP, which is the ion activation or activity product, and then we have the saturation index, which is computed as the log value, this value here, minus the, the actual log KSP. It says KS, it's KSP. So that's the solubility product. So the, the um, IAP here is, is really, uh, if you think about equilibria, this is Q. This is uh, when the system is not at equilibrium. And uh, K is, of course, when the system is at equilibrium. And so you're just finding the difference there and that kind of tells you the direction um, that that mineral should move with its relationship or interface with water as it if, if it is moving towards uh, equilibrium and in, in, let's say a closed system so uh, in this case this this column here is the real data uh, these are the the actual ion products based on the concentrations of those species calcium 2 plus and sulfate for this anhydride and then the saturation index, uh, you get this color coding here. If it's zero, it means that it's at equilibrium uh, or apparent equilibrium. And if it is uh, this positive value, then it means it's super saturated, meaning that uh, your ion product is in excess of what the equilibrium solubility product should be, meaning that uh, if we're thinking about it just from a thermodynamic perspective, you might expect uh, the, that mineral to precipitate. Uh, and similarly, for the blue values or the negative values, those are undersaturated with respect to that particular solid phase. And so we can go through this. This is pretty nice because it tells us, if we just look through this color coding, you can get a pretty quick sense whether or not this particular solution has any minerals that may be precipitating or dissolving, uh, for that matter. And so uh, we can see that um, there's some small saturation uh, our supersaturation of the calcium carbonate in the aragonite uh, mineral form, uh, and similarly uh, with uh, the calcite form, uh, which would be expected in uh, natural waters. 
And then uh, we have this mixed calcium magnesium dolomite uh, phase as well. And so this is a really nice uh, quick check, uh, especially if you see precipitates or evaporites that are adjacent to the natural waters when you're sampling. Um, this gives you a sense for whether that's predicted, whether the system's at equilibrium or moving towards equilibrium. can also give you some sense if you're sampling, say, groundwater or spring water, and it's interfacing uh, with different types of rock, uh, whether or not, what's the direction that that system is moving towards. Okay, so that's where we're going to leave it. Of course, there's lots more information that this software can provide for you. Uh, so I encourage you to play around with it. Um, there's a lot of more advanced models for uh, speciating uh, based on redox, so looking across oxidation states for systems, and also modeling absorption or, or, or uh, different gases in the atmosphere. Um, so there's a lot of, of possibility with the software, but um, for ion balance, this is what we'll use it for.